Welcome to Pavenars, webinars for the pavement community. My name is Andrew Bram, and today we're going to talk about pervious pavements. So we'll start out with the background. This will include an introduction to pavements, surface and bound layers, and also system components of pervious pavements. We'll talk a little bit about hydrology design, including site considerations and runoff analysis. We'll talk a little bit about structural design, and we'll go over examples for asphalt concrete or asphalt mixtures, Portland cement concrete, and interlocking pavements. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about what happens in the field, and this includes construction, maintenance, and also how can we obtain lead credits by using pervious pavements. Now, before we start talking about pervious pavements, Let's talk about what is a pavement's purpose, and this is any pavement. The most important thing is we want a safe traveling surface. We want to have the proper structural capacity for the loads being applied. We want the pavements to be smooth. We want them to drain water, and on traditional pavements, this means that you want the surface to drain water away from the structure. You'll see with pervious pavements, it's a completely different concept. However, we do want to manage the drainage of water for all pavements. And then we want there to be good surface friction between the tires of the vehicles and the pavement surface. And this is regardless of the type of pavement. All types of pavement, you want these five items. And let's take a look at just how many roads there are in the United States to talk about the scope of what pervious pavements could do. Well, for public roads, there are 2.8 million lane miles of paved public roads, and this is according to the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, Table 1-4 from 2020. And if we assume the lanes are 12 feet wide, that means we have about 6,000 400 square miles of pavement, just under 6,400 square miles. And I don't know about you, but I don't understand that number. That is a lot of square miles, but I don't understand the magnitude of that. What I do understand is American football. And if you include end zones, that'll be 120 yards long, there, that equals 3.1 million American football fields. So the amount of paved public roads we have in the United States equals 3.1 million American football fields. So this is an absolutely huge surface, and most of these roads have relatively low permeability. And when we think about most of our roads, we have some sort of bound layer in our pavement structure, and this can be anywhere from 3 to 12 inches thick. Under that, we have base courses. These are large engineered unbound aggregates, and they're four to 12 inches thickness of base course. Our sub base course is generally a modified subgrade, so modified in place soil, and this can be anywhere from four to 12 inches. And then we have our subgrade, which is our natural in place soil. So this is a very typical pavement structure, bound layers, a base course, sub base course, and subgrade. And the thickness and the material you use for each one of these layers is a function of the application, how you're going to use it, the loads being applied, what sort of local materials you have available, the history of your pavement, and also the environment. Now for this presentation, we're going to focus in on the bound layers, so just that top part of the pavement surface. And there are three typical bound layers used for pervious pavement. The first is asphalt concrete. And asphalt concrete is typically placed in multiple lifts, and the lifts closer to the surface usually have smaller aggregate and higher asphalt binder contents. We have Portland cement concrete. This is typically placed in one single thick lift. And then also there are two other types which kind of overlap, not quite overlap. We have permeable interlocking concrete pavement, or PICP, and we also have bricks. So there are pervious pavement surfaces made out of asphalt concrete, Portland cement concrete, PICP, and bricks. 
but an important part of pervious pavements are the system. So when I look at the system of pervious pavements, we have some sort of surface on top. We then have a stabilizer course. Going down in the pavement structure, we have a stone reservoir and a geotextile. And then we have uncompacted subgrade at the bottom. Now the point of this is that pervious pavements are a paving system designed to manage and treat runoff. So it's not just a surface layer necessarily, but it's a system and it includes all these components. Now when we think about pervious pavement, you'll hear terms as such as permeable, porous, and pervious pavements. So all three of these are kind of used interchangeably. But when I talk about pervious pavements, I think of this system. So on the top, you have a pervious pavement layer. This is Portland cement concrete, asphalt concrete, or it can be the interlocking bricks or just standard bricks. But for the uh, Portland cement concrete and the asphalt concrete, so the bound layers, you have 16 to 22% air voids and as I mentioned, you can also use either bricks or the PICP. You then have a stabilizer course, and this stabilizes the surface for paving. This small stabilizer course is very important. You then have a stone reservoir, and these are uniformly sized rocks, about 40% voids. And the purpose of this is to have temporary water storage. So the water goes through your pervious pavement layer, through the stabilizer course, and then sits on the stone reservoir. And over time, the water that's temporarily stored in the storm reservoir goes through a geotextile fabric. This fabric allows water to pass, but it prevents any migration of fines up into the stone reservoir. And those fines would come from the uncompacted subgrade. So the whole point of this system is to allow the water to go into the stone reservoir it sits in the stone reservoir, and then over time, it can just go into the uncompacted subgrade at whatever uh, speed that uncompacted subgrade allows. So that is a background of pervious pavements. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about the applications and hydrology. So we use pervious pavements usually in lower volume roads, and that can be parking areas or actual roads themselves. We can also use them on pedestrian walkways, sidewalks, in driveways, bike lanes, and shoulders. And they're often used in conjunction with traditional pavements. So you can see the picture on the right has a traditional dense graded asphalt mixture where the cars drive, but then those parking spaces are pervious pavement. And that allows water to go into there, and then this actually goes then into that median, which it looks like it's a, a bioswale. Now, what are some site considerations when we're placing our pervious pavement? Well, we want to make sure our soil infiltration rates are within a range from 0.1 to 10 inches per hour. So we don't want the uh, water to go into the soil system too quickly, but we also want to make sure that it can infiltrate into the subgrade quick enough to clear out that stone reservoir. We want to make sure the uh, max minimum depth to bedrock or the seasonal high level water level is greater than two feet because we don't want natural water or bedrock preventing water from going into the ground immediately underneath the paved surface. We want to make sure the bottom of the stone reservoir is at 60% of the frost depth. So if you do have a freeze very quickly after a big rain, you don't get freezing water in that stone reservoir. You want to make sure the bottom of that infiltration bed or the stone reservoir is flat because you want the water to sit on that geotextile fabric and infiltrate into the soil. If there is parking, you want to have that parking slope less than 5%. And if it is greater than 5%, you want to terrace your parking lot. And that's so the water doesn't just simply flow off the surface. It goes down into the pervious pavement system. And you want to make sure that your impervious to pervious area is less than a 5 to 1 ratio. And this ensures that you don't have so much impervious surface that the water overwhelms your pervious pavement system. Now, we talk a lot about runoff and infiltration. How do we start quantifying these numbers? 
So when we're talking about the runoff analysis, this determines our layer thickness because we want the water to infiltrate the subgrade, we want it to be stored in the stone reservoir, and if necessary, we want to be able to release excess water. And this comes from both rainfall and stormwater runoff. And the layer thicknesses of our system and the subgrade permeability are key to this analysis. Now the recommended analysis is to use a curved number. So for a quick reminder, the curve run number, uh, you, the end goal is to get the total runoff. And you can see the total runoff, which is Q, is a function of precipitation, P sub G, water loss, I sub A, and storage capacity, S. And then the storage capacity is 1,000 divided by CN, and that CN is the curve number, and you subtract 10. So you can see, based on the curve number, you can calculate the storage capacity. If you have the storage capacity, the water loss, and the precipitation, you can calculate the runoff. Now, what are some typical curve number values? Well, for concrete grid pavers, uh, Typical curve numbers are 41 to 98, and the mean is 70. And you can see that that's based on having uh, some sort of slope, some bedding sand, a geotextile, and some marlstone. Porous concrete, the mixture itself, you want a slope of 0.3, and you want it directly on native fine sand. And you get a curve number between 60 and 91, with a mean of 77. And then for permeable interlocking concrete pavements, PICP, 75 millimeters thick with a whole bunch of descriptive requirements on there. Your curve number is 37 to 50 with a mean of 43. So you can see there's a little bit of a range here within each paving system itself. And then there's also a range within the means. So there's, there's quite a bit to look into. Now, what about an example? Now let's take a look at this parking lot. Now this parking lot, unfortunately, well, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, it no longer exists. This is lot 71, and it's across the street from Bell Engineering here at the University of Arkansas. They're building a new building there, so it doesn't exist. But let's say it still did exist. Let's do an example. It was an asphalt concrete parking lot. So if you go through your analysis for asphalt concrete, you can find the storage using a curve number of 98 uh, feet cubed per second. And then a porous concrete surface, you use a 77 and you get 2.987. So if you have an asphalt surface on your parking lot, your uh, stormwater retention is 0.204 inches. If you have a porous concrete surface, your stormwater retention is 2.987 inches. And then we can uh, calculate the runoff as well. For the asphalt surface, you take the uh, amount of precipitation, which we assumed is 2.6 inches. You plug it into that Q, you get 2.37 inches. And for the porous concrete surface, you get 0.8 inches. So by changing this parking lot from an asphalt surface to a porous concrete surface, you get a change of runoff of 1.57 inches. And that is a decrease in runoff. So this is just one example, and I'm sure you can step outside of whatever building you're in and see some sort of parking lot. And you get an idea of the size of the parking lot based on the number of cars. But you can get an idea of, by changing the surfaces of these parking lots, what kind of change and runoff can we achieve? Now, I did mention a little that there could be some overflow. So if your storm reservoir fills, that water needs to go somewhere. You don't want it to just go up and, and start ponding on the roadway surface. So you can place a perforated pipe just above the geotextile and then have an outlet structure on the side. And you can see that weir is the height of the maximum storage of that storm reservoir. And that can give you an outflow. Another option is instead of having just a perforated, perforated pipe, you can also have a drop inlet at the edge of your roadway, and that drop inlet will allow water to flow off the surface into the drop inlet and also then get control to an outlet. So these are just some different ways to manage if you do exceed the storage capacity of your storm reservoir. What are some options you have in place to manage that? 
So that's a little bit about the hydrology. Now we're going to move into the structural design of pervious pavements. For flexible pavements, we're going to talk about an oldie but a goodie, the 1993 Astro pavement design, and this revolves around layer coefficients. For rigid pavements, we're going to talk about Pervious Pave, which is a program that's put out by the American Concrete Pavement Association, or ACPA. And this includes both structural and hydro hydrological design, hydrological design, excuse me. And then finally, we're going to talk about PICP pavements, both concrete pavement slabs and concrete plank systems. So let's start with flexible pavements. Now we're going to talk about the 1993 AASHTO design, which is the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. And the, this 1993 AASHTO design revolves around your pavement thickness. And you start out with your structural number, and that equals layer coefficients multiplied by each layer's thickness. So SN is the structural number, and we generally round this to the nearest point one. The small a is layer coefficient, and capital D is the pavement layer thickness. And the pavement layer thickness must be in inches. And whenever I talk about this in classes, I always give a pavement layer thickness in a unit other than inches, and you'll get an answer, and that answer will be incorrect. So please make sure you use the right units. Now, how do you find a structural number? The structural number you find by solving your nomograph, and this is from the 1993 Ashto Pavement Design Guide. And in short, on the left we have our uncertainties, which are our reliabilities and our overall standard deviations. And to use a nomograph, you simply connect the dots. So you have your reliability, your standard deviation, you draw a line. At the turn line, you pivot and then draw a line through the traffic. And the traffic is in easels, the equivalent single axle load applications. You hit a turn lane, then you drive a draw a line through the effective roadbed soil resilient modulus, M sub R, so the soil. You then hit a turn line, you drive through the pavement performance, which is the pavement serviceability index or the change in pavement serviceability index. And then you drop down and you get the structural number. So the structural number is a function of uncertainty, traffic, soil, pavement performance. You put all those in as your input, you connect the dots, and you get your structural number. So that's the left side of equation, and on the right side of the equation, we have layer coefficients and we have our thicknesses. So how do we get layer coefficients? Well, these are layer coefficients from Arkansas Department of Transportation, and you can see we have multiple surface courses, stabilized bases, base courses, lime-treated subgrades. ACHM stands for Asphalt Concrete Hot Mix, that's an RDOT term. And you can see the surface layer has the highest, it's 0.44, and that's either for a 9.5 or a 12.5 millimeter nominal maximum aggregate size. The binder course, which is 25 millimeter nominal maximum aggregate size, is also 0.44. But then the base course, the asphalt concrete hot mix base course, the largest stone, 37.5 millimeter nominal maximum aggregate size, our layer coefficient drops down to 0.36. Our stabilized base is 0.2, our base courses are 0.14 or 0.11, depending on the size. Class 7 is a little larger than class 5. And then the lime treated subgrade is the lowest to 0.07. And you can find these in RDOT, Arkansas Department of Transportation's Roadway Design Plan Development Guidelines. So if you search online for Roadway Design Plan Development Guidelines, you'll find this PDF document and this table is on page a1, so the first page of Appendix A. So just for fun, let's go through an example. Let's say we have an asphalt concrete hot mix surface layer. We don't know the thickness, but we know the coefficient. Let's say we have six inches of base course and 10 inches of subbase. We're going to use our structural number. Let's assume the structural number is 4.0, but we have three layers. So we have A1, A2, A3. We have D1, D2, D3. And we say our structural number is 4.0, and we set it equal to our equation. We know everything but D1. So we have A1, A2, A3 is 0 0.44, 0 0.14, and 0.11. We have D1, D2, and D3. Oh, excuse me, we don't have D1. We're solving for D1, but we have D2, which is 6 inches. We have D3, which is 10 inches. We simply rearrange, solve for D1. And if I did my calculation right, D1 is 4.7 inches. So we have 4.7 inches of asphalt concrete hot mix. 
and that would probably be rounded up to 5 inches, a nice whole number. <clears throat> so we know about the structural number equation, we know about layer coefficients and the thicknesses, but what are some pervious pavement layer coefficients for flexible pavement? Well, porous asphalt is a little lower than the traditional dense graded, which is 0.40 to 0.42 for the porous asphalt. Our asphalt treated permeable base is about 0.3 to 0.35. And then the stone reservoir is generally 0.1 to 0.14. So that gives you an idea of the range of numbers for our layer coefficients. And you can see that it's a little lower than traditional asphalt concrete mixture uh, layer coefficients, but not that much lower. Now, it, it is a little bit of work to go through and solve these structural numbers. So there are some rule of thumbs, which are very handy, especially for smaller agency. If you're using a parking lot with little or no trucks, you can simply put 2.5 inches of the asphalt concrete surface layer. If you're on a residential street with some trucks, they recommend four inches with the surface course and then a little larger aggregate base. And then if you have heavy truck, it's a total of six inches. So those are just some rules of thumbs if you um, are designing a pavement structure for porous pavement, for flexible pavements. Now let's take a look at rigid pavement structural design. As I mentioned, we use a computer program called Pervious Pave, and this is put out by ACPA. And basically it's a porous concrete thickness that's based on both traffic and design life. And the sub base and the reservoir thickness is based on stormwater management. Now, when we talk about the pervious concrete, fatigue design dominates. And that's because when you have a road, there's a repeated vehicle loads. This means that you have high replicates and small strains on your pavements, and that leads to fatigue damage. So lots of replication, or lots of replicates, small strains, that is a recipe for fatigue. So what are some of the inputs for the structural design of rigid pavements? Well, the fatigue damage from the concrete comes from traffic. You can have single tandem or tritum loads, and they put the applied stress at a slab edge, so on the side of a slab. For the concrete material, you want the modulus of elasticity, your flexural strength, and your Poisson's ratio. For the soil, you want the modulus of subgrade reaction. And you assume that the pavement end of life is when you have 15% of your slabs cracked. So this is how they determine the concrete portion of the pavement structure from fatigue damage. And the hydraulic design, this is the stone reservoir, is based on the area of the pervious concrete and the non-pervious surrounding area that will be drained into the pervious concrete. It's also a function of the storm intensity and the detention time of the water in the pavement structure. How long do you want the water sitting in there? And then there's also other variables like the height of the curb, how much ponding is allowed, and the void ratio of the concrete. You have the void ratio and the thickness of the reservoir, and finally the permeability of soil. So you can see there's a whole bunch that is listed in here. Now I'm not gonna go over all this, but ACPA does have a document. So if you search background, purpose, assumption, and equations of porous concrete, ACPA, or some sort of combination of that, you'll be able to find this document. But the document itself is called Background Purpose Assumptions and Equations. Um, it doesn't have pervious pavement anywhere in the title of the document, but if you Google all that, you, you should be able to find it. ACPA is a very nice website uh, with those resources available on it. Now finally for the PICP, this is for the um, interlocking concrete pavement. The structural design, we can have a concrete paving slab. This is where your face is greater than 101 square inches. Your length to thickness ratio is greater than four. Your minimum thickness is 1.2 inches and your maximum length and width would be 48 inches. So if you pass all of these dimensional requirements, you have a concrete paving slab. Now, a concrete plank system is when your length is anywhere from just under 12 inches to 48 inches and your width is 3 to 6 inches. Your length to width ratios and length to thickness ratios all need to be greater than 4 and your minimum thickness is 2.36 inches. So these are a little bigger, a little thicker, uh, but you can see the difference here between paving slabs and plank systems and, and the uh, PICP divides us into two different categories. 
And regardless of the type, there's seven steps in design. First, you need to determine the traffic, then you need to determine the soil strength. So my soil colleagues will be happy because everything depends on the soil, which is, is true. You also determine the paving slab length and width. You select what kind of base you're going to put underneath the PICP. Then you find your slab length, width, and thickness. You match your soil characteristics and you match the traffic. So it's a, it's a little bit of an iterative process. You, you talk about traffic and soil, then you pick the slabs, you select the base, you select the slab length, width, and thickness, and then you go back and you check the soil and the traffic to make sure everything is appropriate. And the design tables for the slabs and planks are very similar. So for both slabs and planks, you have your paving slab length, width, and thickness, and then you have your uh, aggregate base thickness. So this example is for a 12 inch minimum aggregate base thickness. And then you have different minimum flexural strengths for the paving slab. This one's for 725 PSI. And then the table is based on the subgrade modulus in PSI and the CBR in R value. So you can, or excuse me, the CBR and the R value. So this one table has a specific aggregate base thickness, a specific flexural strength of your material, and then you have different subgrade modulus and CBR values. You have four different columns. So you can see here is one example of the same slab length and width, 12 inches, and then you have different thicknesses. And what's being shown here is what type of pavement surface you can place this on. So this is for 12 inches by 12 inches. We have 16 by 16, 18 by 18, 24 by 24. And we have anywhere from two to four inches thick. Now you're probably wondering, what do those all stand for? What does P stand for? What does LT stand for? Well, if you see a no in there, that means that you can't have any vehicles. So zero vehicles, only pedestrian. If you see a P, that means it's primarily for pedestrians, but you can have a very limited amount of vehicles. C is designed for cars, and LT is for cars and light trucks. And we also have a little more information about those four categories. So cars only are less than 4,500 pounds, and cars and light trucks are anything less than 10,000 pounds. And you can see there's a stress ratio associated with that. There's also a lifetime easels, so how many total easels you'll expect over your lifespan. So uh, primarily pedestrian, you're only going to have a thousand easels. That's not very many at all. Cars only are 7,500. Cars and light trucks is 3,000. And then you have equivalent heavy vehicles per day. So very, very limited heavy vehicle traffic, even relatively limited vehicle traffic. But it gives you a little idea. Now, uh, the ICPI tech spec has a lot more information on this. So if you search ICPI tech spec 24, you'll be able to find this document, which has all of the information and background and a lot more detail about the design process. So that's a brief inter overview of the structural design. Now let's talk a little bit about being in the field. So for any type of pervious pavement, there's a certain construction sequence. First, you want to avoid any heavy equipment on the subgrade. You want a nice, evenly compacted, homogeneous subgrade. You want to place the fabric, the geotextile fabric, with a minimum of a 16 inch overlap. You want to place the stone reservoir in 8 to 12 inch thick layers carefully because you don't want to punch holes in that fabric. For the asphalt surface, you want to place the asphalt mixture 1 to 4 inches thick. You want to compact two to four times with a 10 ton static roller, and then you want to wait 24 hours before releasing traffic. For a concrete surface, you want to place the concrete mix one to four inches thick. Then you want to put a joint every 20 feet, and you want it to cure with plastic on top. And then for PICP, you want to place it, you want to compact it a little bit, and then you want to spread rock. And that can be either kind of a, almost a coarse out of it or a sand, depending on the paver that's placed. And when you're thinking about all this, both erosion and sediment control is essential. You don't want a lot of sediment getting into your pavement structure. 
So once you place that stone reservoir, you want to make sure no dirt or fines get into that stone reservoir from other parts of your construction site, because that'll just plug the stone reservoir and then there'll be nowhere for that water to sit. So let's take a look at some pictures. So here you can see a nice evenly compacted subgrade. They're overlapping the geotextile by uh, about 16 inches. You then carefully place your open um, uh, stone reservoir stone and then you place a whole bunch of levels of that and you compact. And you can see here that erosion control around the job site preventing any fines from getting into there. For construction of the surfaces you can place the asphalt on top of your stone reservoir through a typical paving train. For rigid pavement, it's a little bit different. You can see that there's forms on each side. You place the mix in those forms, and then you have this wheel compactor that goes over the top of it, and that ensures a very, very nice level riding surface for that pavement surface. And you can see there's a zoom in, there's the form on the left, and that uh, big roller is being dragged over to get a nice, clean surface. So this is the paving, but it's very important then to joint every 20 feet. And you can see this joint being rolled into it. So that means during the contraction during the winter or the um, contraction during the cement hydration, uh, the cracks will form where those joints are. And you'll have very nice controlled cracks for your pervious pavement. And then you wanna cover it and cure it, uh, cure it out so you get that good cement hydration in your pavement structure. For the PICP, you first place those rocks. Uh, you want to make sure they're nice and snug next to each other. You may need to cut on the edges. Then for finishing, you may need to put a little bit of compactive effort on the top just to seat all those rocks. And then you place sand in if you're using bricks. You use stone if you're using PICP. Uh, there's a typo there, I apologize. It's not sand. You need to stand on it, but it's not sand use sewn instead of sand. And you can find more in the ICPI Tech Spec 2 if you're interested in learning more about the construction of these papers. Now for maintenance, your primary objective is to prevent clogging. You want to make sure you measure your surface infiltration rates annually to make sure the water is still able to go into that pavement structure. You want to either vacuum or power wash your pavement two to four times a year to unclog your pervious surfaces. You, uh, a benefit is you don't need as many salts and de-icing chemicals as traditional pavements because not as much water sits on that pavement surface. You want to avoid sanding for winter maintenance. You don't want to have sand clogging up your pores. And you should not place a seal coat or crack seal your pavements either because that will prevent the water from being able to get into your pavement structure. You can patch flexible and rigid pavements if it's less than 10% of the paved area. If it's more than that, it's probably better just to go ahead and redo the entire pavement. And you can simply remove and replace any sort of damaged PCIPs or bricks. <clears throat> so let's take a look at some more pictures. Here's a uh, little bit of coarse area being swept into a PICP pavement surface. Here's a vacuum vacuuming up a pervious surface, getting some of those fines out of there, unclogging that surface layer. Uh, you can also just use a traditional paving uh, broom that you uh, use in any other sitting application. And then here's an example of that pervious uh, infiltration test. So you put some sort of known area, you seal the edges, you fill it with water, and you see how long does it take to drain into that pavement structure. And there needs to be some sort of minimum infiltration rate for your pervious pavement structure to uh, work as designed. Now, in talking about lead, there's a whole bunch of different lead credits that you can apply for using pervious pavements. You can use material reuse if you use a reclaimed asphalt pavement or recycled uh, concrete pavement, or if your pavers or, or bricks have some sort of recycled material in them. Uh, Post-consumer recycled content, again, that goes back to your material reuse. You can also focus on using regional materials in order to get lead credit. You can get lead credit for stormwater, both quantity and quality control. So those are some opportunities. And also you can reduce your heat island effect 
uh, you can get credit for your non-roof applica application in the lead credits. Now, I'm kind of purposely being very high level on these lead credits, and that's because lead credits do change relatively frequently. They're always kind of tweaking it, and I, I don't want to say anything that's going to go out of uh, go out of business right away. So. These are general credits that have been around for a while and all of these you can apply to pervious pavements in some way. So I just wanted to give a very high level overview, but I encourage you to check for updates. You know, make sure that you're doing the most latest and greatest. So in summary, for pervious pavements, we talked about the background, we talked about the hydrology and structural design, and then we talked a little bit about in the field and we finished off with some lead credits. So thank you very much for joining me today and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day.